Hello and welcome back to another lesson on GCSE Physics. Today's learning intention is to calculate density. The first thing I'd like to have a go at please is the fish dog elephant task shown on the board. The fish question is what is meant by internal energy, that's what we looked at last lesson. The dog question, draw a solid, liquid and gas using the kinetic theory model from the start of this topic. And then finally the elephant question, what is a gamma wave? Pause the video, answer each question in full, and then press play to check your answers. So, what is internal energy then? Internal energy is the total sum of the kinetic energy and potential energy of all the particles in a substance. If you haven't mentioned both kinetic and potential energy, you would forfeit that mark. You were then asked to draw a solid, liquid and gas using the kinetic theory model and I've put those diagrams on the board for you now. Please make sure that the particles in a solid are touching, make sure that the particles in a liquid are obviously in an irregular arrangement as shown there and make sure the particles in a gas are randomly distributed with large spaces between them. Then finally, what is meant by a gamma wave? That's from the atomic structure topic. A gamma wave is a high frequency electromagnetic wave from the nucleus of an atom. The success criteria for today is to be able to draw particle diagrams of solids, liquids and gases, to be able to explain what density is and to explain the differences in densities of solids, liquids and gases in terms of the arrangement of atoms. OK, so the first task I would like to do is to look at the pictures on the board. We've got two different substances, one of which is labelled as being high density and one is labelled as being low density. I would like to use these diagrams to explain in your book what you think is meant by the word density. Pause the video and write down your answer and then press play to check your work. So as you can see from the diagram, in the high density substance the particles are very very close together and there are a lot more particles in a certain space. However, for the low density one, the particles are much further apart and so there are fewer particles within a certain space. So we can say that density basically is how close the particles are together and how many particles there are in a certain amount of space. The exact wording of the definition that we need for the exam is that the density of a substance is the mass per unit volume. This equation needs to be learned that density is equal to mass divided by volume. You can write that down in symbols if you wish as rho, which looks like a P, equals M divided by capital V. Now please remember that mass is measured in kilograms, volume is measured in metres cubed and density is measured in kilograms per metre cubed, which is written as a slash between kilogram and metres cubed. Now let's have a go at an exam question. It's worth four marks, so we need to be writing down a minimum of four points to answer this question. It says that diagram one shows how the particles may be arranged in a solid. And that's no surprise from what we see in the diagram. We have learnt about that diagram a few lessons ago. One kilogram of a gas has a much larger volume than one kilogram of a solid. We want to use kinetic theory to explain why. Pause the video, write down your answers please, and then press play to check your work. So the first marking point that we need to consider then as to why one kilogram of a gas has a larger volume than one kilogram of a solid has to be to do with the structure of a solid. Notice, of course, that the particles in a solid are much closer together. The reason that that is the case is that there are strong forces of attraction between the particles in a solid which hold the particles close together. We can expand on those two points as well and say that they are held together in a regular arrangement which means that the density of the solid is going to be very high. Now there's four marking points there, but to access a full four marks, we do need to refer to the gas. So if you've missed out any of those, don't worry, we can get more marks to talk about the gas. We can say that in a gas, the forces of attraction are negligible. The word negligible just means hardly existing or almost zero. And then the final possible mark that we can have is say that because the forces of attraction are negligible, the particles can spread out and be much further apart from each other. So obviously any four of those six points will get you four marks for this exam question. OK, now I'd like you to have a go with this worksheet, please. Complete it on your own. Obviously, you will need a calculator to do it. Um, if you can't see the questions from this uh, area on the board here, as we click through the PowerPoint, you can pause the video when the questions come up and then check them by pressing play. 
So the first question says the images below show the particles in a substance when it is in three different states of matter. Label each image to show whether it is a solid, a liquid or a gas. So the first one, you can see the particles are in an irregular arrangement, so this would obviously be a liquid. In the next one, we can see that the particles are in a much more regular arrangement, so we would label this as a solid. And then finally, we've got the particles being much further apart and moving in random directions. That makes this the particles in a gas. Then we move on to the proper question, starting at grade four. A 0.5 meter cube block of tungsten has a mass of 10,000 kilograms. We want to write down the equation that links density, mass and volume. So we've learned that equation today is that density is equal to mass divided by volume. We then want to calculate the density of the tungsten using the information in the question. Well, the mass was 10,000 and the volume is 0.5. They're in kilograms and meters cubed, so we don't need to do any conversion of units. So we can just do 10,000 divided by 0.5, which gives us an answer of 20,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Question 1.3. We want to calculate the mass of a 0.02 meter cubed sample cut from the tungsten block. Now to do this we will need to rearrange that equation because it needs to be written as mass equals. So to get it written as mass equals we draw a formula triangle. Mass goes at the top and then density and volume go at the bottom which means that mass is equal to density multiplied by volume. Now we've worked out what the density of tungsten was in the previous question so if we multiply that by 0.02 we get the correct answer of 400 kilograms. Question two, Eric notices that ice cubes float when he puts them into a glass of water. This is because ice is less dense than liquid water. Explain what this suggests about the arrangement of the water molecules in each state. So if the ice is less dense than the liquid water, then that must mean that the particles are further apart, which is what I've got the first mark there for. Then the second mark is saying there is fewer particles in a certain amount of volume of ice. Now that might come as a slight contradiction to what you have learned so far in the video in the sense that you've learned that solids are more dense than liquids but uh, ice is a very unusual substance and ice is actually less dense in its solid state but that isn't true for the vast majority of substances. Uh, we have something called the anomalous expansion of water when it changes from ice to, uh, to a, uh, from a solid ice to a liquid water, uh, you learn more about that when you do A-level physics. Okay, now then there's two sets of questions you can have a go at here, either the grade 6 and grade 7 or the grade 8 and grade 9. Obviously you can choose which set of questions match your target grade and have a go at those. By all means, push yourselves and try a harder set if you wish to, but I would expect you to complete a minimum of two sets, either the grade six and seven or the eight and nine. Grade six, question one. The specific latent fusion heat of water is 340,000 joules per kilogram. Explain carefully what this means. So specific latent heat is obviously the amount of energy needed to change state. And we know that fusion is to do with going from a solid to a liquid. So the answer to this question is that it would take 340,000 joules of energy to turn one kilogram of ice into water. Question two, three kilograms of water is heated up to its boiling point. The specific latent heat of vaporization for water is 2,260,000 joules per kilogram. How much energy is required to turn this water into steam? So we'll be using the equation from the previous lesson that we've learned that energy is equal to mass multiplied by specific latent heat. Now we substitute the numbers in and I would expect you to see, uh, show the substitution in your working out, three multiplied by 2,260,000 to give you the correct final answer of 6,780,000 joules. Question three, five kilograms of oil is heated up to its boiling point. The specific latent heat of vaporization for oil is 780 joules per kilogram. How much energy is required to vaporise the oil? Well, the procedure is the same as the last question. We write down the equation first of all. Please don't forget to write down the equation when you're showing your working out. We then substitute in the numbers. So we do 5 multiplied by 780, which gives us the correct final answer of 3,900 joules. 
Grade 7. Two kilograms of water was placed in a saucepan and heated to 100 degrees Celsius. The water then completely boiled into steam. Here is some data about water and steam and it tells us what the density of water is, what the density of steam is and obviously you can see that the density of steam is much less. Latent heat of vaporisation of water is 2,260,000 joules per kilogram. Then part A says explain why the density of steam is much smaller than the density of water. Well the reason for that is that the particles are much further apart in steam than they are in ice and so there are fewer particles within a certain volume. Part B. Calculate the volume of steam produced once all the water has boiled. So now once the water is boiled it's no longer water of course it is now steam. So in terms of choosing information that's given to us we will be using the information regarding steam. So if we know what the density of the steam is, the mass will be unchanged because 2 kilograms of water will become 2 kilograms of steam. That's due to the conservation of mass. So we write down the equation that we're going to be using. It's density equals mass divided by volume, but I want to work out the volume. So to rearrange this equation, I will draw an equation triangle that has mass at the top and then density and volume on the bottom. Now because I want volume, obviously if you cover volume up with your thumb, you can see that you've got mass divided by density, because mass is on top of density. So volume is mass divided by density, so we do 2 divided by 0.59, which gives us the correct final answer of 3.4, I have rounded that, metres cubed. Part C. Calculate how much energy was needed to boil the water into steam at 100 degrees Celsius. So to make that change of state happen then, we need to consider what the latent heat of vaporisation is. So we use energy equals mass multiplied by specific latent heat. So we do 2 multiplied by 2,260,000, which gives the correct final answer of 4,520,000 joules. Grade 8, question 1. In a practical, students found that using a kettle Produced, uh, using an electric kettle produced around 2,000 joules of energy every second. It was left boiling for 120 seconds and then turned off. It was found to have lost around 105 grams of water and we want to calculate the student's specific latent heat of vaporisation for the water. So to do that then it's a case of using the equation we've been battering in this worksheet already that energy is mass times specific latent heat but this time I am working out the specific latent heat. I need to write the equation, therefore, as specific latent heat equals. To do that, we use an equation triangle. We're going to be having energy on the top, and then mass and specific latent heat will go on the bottom. We now rearrange the equation to work out what specific latent heat is, and it is, of course, energy divided by mass. The reason for that is that energy is on top of mass in that triangle. Now we need to substitute the values in. Now the energy isn't 2,000 because it says that it makes 2,000 joules of energy every second and it's on for 120 seconds. So the actual amount of energy used in this case then is 120 times 2,000 which is 240,000 joules of energy. Likewise there is an issue with the mass saying that it's 105 grams because we should be working in kilograms, so 105 grams we divide by 1,000 to give us 0 0.105 kilograms. We put those two numbers into the equation, as I've shown you there on the board, and that gives us the correct final answer of 2,285,714 joules per kilogram. Question number two. What mass of ice requires 120,000 joules of energy to melt it while remaining at zero degrees? The latent heat of fusion of ice is 334,000 joules per kilogram. So we use the equation energy is mass times specific latent heat again, and again we need to draw an equation triangle to actually um, rearrange the equation. I want to find the mass, so if I cover mass up with my thumb, I can see that I've got energy on top of specific latent heat. So therefore mass is energy divided by specific latent heat. We substitute the values in that we have, we know that the energy is 120,000 and that the specific latent heat is 334,000 and so when we do that division it comes out as 0.36 kilograms. I have rounded that answer so if you've got something slightly different don't worry about it. Then finally the grade 9 question which is the hardest question um, of all of these. It says how long, long, how long does the kettle of grade 8 question 1 take to come to boil 
if three kilograms of ice at zero degrees Celsius is put in it. The latent heat of fusion of ice is 334,000 joules per kilogram and the specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 joules per kilogram degrees C. So we've put ice in, we've put three, three kilograms of ice in at zero degrees into this kettle. Now what happens to get that ice to boil, the first thing that needs to happen is that we need to melt the ice and that requires energy. Once the ice is melted, we then need to increase the temperature of the ice to 100 degrees C. So we'll actually be doing two calculations here. One calculation to see how much energy is needed to melt the ice and then a second calculation to work out how much energy is needed to lift the temperature from 0 degrees to 100 degrees Celsius. So the first calculation is using energy equals mass times specific latent heat. We substitute the numbers into that that we have. So we do 3 multiplied by 334,000, which gives an answer of 1,002,000 joules. And that is the amount of energy needed to melt 3 kilograms of ice. We now need to work out the amount of energy that it takes to turn that now water from 0 degrees up to 100 degrees. And we use an equation from the energy topic, which is the one for specific heat capacity. Specific heat capacity is included in this equation here. Energy equals mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change. Now, the mass is still going to be 3 kilograms because if we had 3 kg of ice, we now have 3 kg of water. The heat capacity was given to us in the question. Now, the temperature change, well, ice boils at, uh, water boils at 100 degrees C. It's currently at zero, so the temperature change is 100. So we do 3 multiplied by 4,200 multiplied by 100, which gives us an answer of 1,260,000 joules. So the total energy that we've used then by the kettle is going to be 1,260,000 1, plus 1,200,000, which gives 2,262,000 joules of energy in total. Now I need to know how long it's taken the kettle to do that, because that was the aim of the question. Well, because we're using the kettle from grade 8 question 1, which provided 2,000 joules of energy every second, I can do the amount of energy divided by 2,000 to work out that it takes 1,131 seconds to do this um, boiling. Now, if you've left your answer as that, that's absolutely fine, but you might have wanted to convert it into something a little bit more user-friendly and found that it would take 18.9 minutes. So it's not a very good kettle, but there we go.